Good day to viewers, the Colonel speaking to you live from the Lay Rectory and we're with the Squire. Good morning, Squire. Good morning, Colonel. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Hmm. Fair to muddling, I think, is the answer. <laughs> Mustn't grumble. Still here. <laughs> you are most certainly still here. <laughs> and what are you showing us today? Some, some very large records, unless we have shrunk. They're large records. Well, these are some of my collection. Are, well, there are only two. I mean, I have got about 25 of them. These yes. are... These are 16-inch diameter records, Yes. and what these are, are soundtracks to the early talking films. Right, I'll, yeah, I'll actually get up so we can see the label. There it is. What Women Did For Me. What does this one? Let Her Buck. Yes, well that one, that one's about an American rodeo. We'll put that one on in a minute. This one, <coughs> I did a bit of research into this. I've had these records for a long time. <coughs> But with what one can get on the internet, one can get a lot of uh, bit of info on there. I'd always thought that some of these recordings were actually to uh, accompany cartoon films. Mm, I did when I first heard them, yes. But I, with a bit of research I did in the last couple of days, I've got two records upstairs, which was a film for um, Wrong Ag called Wrong Again, mm. and that sounded cartoonish. But then I with a bit of research I realised it was actually the music track for a silent which was a film that was originally shot silent and that was a Laurel and Hardy comedy. It was, it was, yes I, I saw that because it starts off with the music hall tune Comrades. That's right. That's and then it. it goes on with something that's um, sort of comedic and it sounded very cartoonish and in those days before the internet we didn't know but now you know. Well that's the film, the film, and the music tracks are actually on YouTube, and it's well worth watching. I think mm -hmm. I enjoyed it to hear the music. You know, the, the, the obviously on a good or uh, perfect set of discs which are being cleaned up. It was interesting. So what they, what those discs really were was was taking the place of the cinema orchestra, I would think, mm -hmm. and that the um, and the music instead of played by the orchestra was recorded onto the discs. Right. Well, this is another st one which is a similar story. This is um, a film called What Women Did For Me. Now, I've, uh, I've checked this, and this was 1927, so it is quite early for a, for a sound film, but then again, I think it's one of those cases where it was a silent film and music tracks were added to it. Yes. But the funny thing about it is this, is the, the film... Uh, was a Hal Roach film, a Hal Roach comedy, yes. with a man called Charlie Chase, and the the girl in it was Lupi Velez. Mm. And the film, as I say, was What Women Did For Me, and it uh, was distributed in this country by BIP, British International Pictures, Warder Films, so that's why you've got on the label, we've yes. got Warder Films at the top. Yes. But the strange thing is this is an American film, and yet it says there... Recorded and pressed by the Vocalian Gramophone Company, La Hayes Middlesex, London. Amazing. So yes. it suggests to me that it's an American film, and they must have got some kind of some kind of permission to do a, mu a record a music track for it in this country. Weird. Because otherwise, it, I would have expected it to have been American American discs. Indeed so. But then Charlie Chase, as I recall, was in Sons of the Desert. He was the a Laurel and Hardy yeah, he film. Yeah, he was a he was a, a comedy actor at that he time. He was. He was very good. Hmm. Can't remember what happened to him. No. Well, this is. Now I hope this thing won't play up. It does sometimes. <laughs> Everything plays up when it's being filmed, Nigel. That's the rule. Of course, it's centre start. Oh, we should do it properly, really, shouldn't we? Not do it like that. What you should do, of course, with one of these, is to find the start mark. Ah, yes. Put the needle. Because, of course, they would have had to do this in the, the dark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I do hope this doesn't fly up.
us uh, a taste of that. I know that waltz. I know that waltz. So. Well, that was, I think that's Dreams on the Ocean, isn't it? Oh, yes. Gungle, I believe. Yes, indeed. Well, it carries on in much the same ilk, but what some fantastic music on it. It was, and of course, I think we ought to point out that on the back of the projector, there would have been a turntable, and the sound oh, would have yes. gone through to speakers either side Absolutely. of the stage. Yeah, well, well, what they would have had to have done, if I take the record off, I can show you this. If you can see the shadow of it, you may not be able to. But just up there, you'll see, you might see an arrow. Ah. Mm. And that's where the groove starts. Yes, we can just see that. So that's where the needle would have to have been placed. And you can see the scratch marks where the projectionist has <laughs> tried to get it right. And they've obviously banged it down on here and, and uh, uh, caused the dig, which caused that trouble while it was, was playing up. Well, there's that wonderful film, The Smallest Show on Earth, where they show very similar things. Mm. Mm. And you've got Peter Sellers as the projectionist <laughs> in the projection box, getting very hot. <laughs> well, a film that's well worth seeing regarding early cinema. It's one of my f all-time favourites. is an Australian film called The Picture Show Man. Oh yes. And that is about two travelling, two travelling men who go around. They're both sort of lovable rogues. They go around um, up the sort of back of the uh, outback of Australia, going to village halls and showing and showing films mm. and they start off in the early days with silence and then towards the end it shows they buy a, buy a sound set and they actually shows the disc and the projector running in the film which Amazing. is well worth seeing they've used a lot of historic equipment in that from the uh, sort of Australian historic department or whatever mm. it is so it's, it's a film well worth seeing if you're into early films how oh, interesting well that's that one uh, I've got quite a few of these upstairs, but I thought we'd just pick two out just to start mm. with. Now this is another one. This this is a nine. This is a Pathé Exchange disc. Oh yes. Now see, they're made by different companies. See, the name that most people think of is Vitaphone. Yes. Well, they, it's a Vitaphone system, but then other companies made them. That disc we just played was Vocalian Gramophone Company. Mm. They're the ones that made labels like um, oh, Vocalion of course Aeolian, Broad Vocalion. Aeolian Broadcast Records were theirs or some of them Yes. now this is a this is a different one this, this is an American recording this is made by RCA right and this they called their recording RCA Photophone right and as you can see there it's Pathé Exchange has that thing died on me? no it's still there just about uh, Pathé Exchange well that was a company I think which did smaller films one or two reelers. Well, this is a single reel film. I wish we could see it because it's a uh, it's filmed at an American rodeo. Oh, that's why the title is Letter Buck. Yeah, someone has written that in large letters <laughs> on the sleeve. I'm not quite sure why. Try a dozen times to find. Uh, it always goes wrong when it's on film night, and that's the rule, unfortunately, especially when I do things.
Sounds like a society meeting. to the end. Right. That's obviously the Pathé. Pathé Rooster. Yes, indeed. Well, <laughs> I have to point out, viewers, that was not the soundtrack to a certain society's meeting. It just sounded like it. <laughs> All that mooing and barring. I think the point is with that, though, is what one has to remember is that that would have had to have been recorded as the film was being made. Yes. There was no chance for any editing with that. No. You just started off and you had to sort of stick the microphone up and see what you've got, really. <laughs> How that they must have had some kind of music there to have added the... You know, put the music on the front of the disc. They must have done that on set site. Yeah. Because um, there was no way of... See, the thing is with these records is they run for... About eight to ten minutes. I was going to say, what is the speed of these records? Well, the idea is, you see, to cover a reel of film. You see, if a reel mm. of film is about like that, that runs yes. for about ten minutes, then the, disc, the sound disc has got to run with that. Mm. And then the projectors would have two projectors and would start disc one on, on projector one, disc two on projector two, and while, when they're ready, they switch from one to the other. Right take the things off the first projector and put the third one on. Yes. And they would have had to have gone on like that. And those, see, those sound discs 
were made at the time of filming. They, mm. they, <coughs> they, they would, they obviously had somebody with a microphone, a trailing microphone out there trying to get what they can, but it yes. would all gone on the disc. Yes. <coughs> what, what speed are they? Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Thirty-three yeah. and a third cent. And what are the dates? That one's nineteen thirty. Right. So it's con these are all of considerable age. Yes, indeed. But that first one I played you, it was nineteen about 1927, so that's really early, an early sound disc. That's amazing, mm. absolutely amazing. Of course, it's, <laughs> it's easy to laugh at these things, isn't it, viewers? But, um, you know, when you haven't got the film, when you could, it would explain what's going on. That's the problem, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether there's any... There might be in archives in America, but I can't believe there are any co any copies of prints. Surprising what has survived, oddly I know, enough. I it know. really is surprising. Well, I think that, um, that they were. I think that what women did for me, I looked, and they said the film exists, but it needs restoring. Ah. But um, no, it's good to be able to key in these titles on the mm. the internet and try and get some details because I've had the records. I've had these records for about. 25, 30 years. Good Lord. So it's only recently I've been able to find out a few things about them and I'm trying to research the other discs I've got. Mm. So I've got other film discs. I remember you there. telling me uh, many years ago at the Jam Factory you um, about a, a lot of old cinema discs that were used as steps in this old cinema. Well, I was told this. You see, now mm. I bought the first ones of these I found I got down in Bath. And there was a chap there I used to deal with gramophones and records, and he'd got a pile of these sound discs, and I bought so many the first day, then I had to sort of quickly get some funds up together and go down and buy the rest. Mm. So I came back with quite a pile of them. And from another source, completely separately, I heard that there was some cinema in Bath that they got into the projection room and they'd found this pile of big records that somebody was using as a step to get up to the, up the shelves, which Amazing. is scandalous, really, because they... These were never issued to the public. You and see. they're not they're vinyl, they are shellac. Oh, these are shellac, yes, Yes, indeed. so yeah, if you step on them, they do crack. Just as a 78. We won't demonstrate that. But no, we <laughs> I mean, it's undesirable, to be honest. But yes. yes. Oh, but, very interesting. But I've always... This is the sort of thing that I find interesting, because mm. it's off the beaten track. Yes. And um, so if I see any more, I shall get hold of them. Mm. I've got other 16-inch records upstairs, with some of which are made for MGM and they're sort of music, more music tracks, mm. but they're much later, they're on 16-inch records on red vinyl. Yes. And then of course you get records like 16-inch diameter which are acetates, right. which are metal acetates. And I've got one up there that's an 8, and I've got two more upstairs which are 18-inch acetate discs. Good Lord. Now at the moment I don't have anything to play those, I've got to modify a turntable to do that. Mm, that is the point, you know, you, you can and have got that record on there well this this isn't because designed for that this oh. is i what i've had to do you see is to raise see the tone arm at the back you can raise and lower yes so i've raised it up mm. that it clears the record so and move the i've taken the pickup arm rest which mm. goes under the record itself with this and got to drill a hole in the cabinet and mount it there so we can actually mm. rest the arm and not damage the stylus so with a modification, this pattern of gold ring Lanco turntable mm. will play 16-inch records. Which one is it again? 67, isn't it? GL67? GL68. 68. Well, I think the 68, 69, 70, 72 series will do mm. it, but the GL75s don't. They mm. don't. They're not easy to modify. And there's an older series of which were grey, which were um, had a big, heavy-looking mm. tone arm. I think it was the GL65. They'll do it. So you can get equipment to play them. Um, Garrard 4HF turntables to play them, and there was a mm. big Calaro turntable. Right. You see, people talk used to talk in the 60s and 70s about transcription turntables. Mm. Well, it was always thought that a transcription turntable made one meant to be one of top quality. Well, it, it was, but the Id the original idea of a transcription turntable was to play 16-inch records. Mm. So. So in the 50s, they made quite a few that would do that. But the 18-inch ones, I'm having to, I'm going to have to modify, modify a length and a tone arm and remount it, and then hopefully I'll be able to play those. Wow, oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's, I say anything like this is the sort of thing I find very interesting because it's off the beaten track and it's always a bit of a challenge to play them. Yes, well, of course, Pathé made 20-inch records, but they weren't. Um 
for cinemas or anything like that. They were commercially issued, amazingly. Exactly. It's supposed to be louder, but I've never quite found that. I, Yes, I, I know what you mean, because you can get some 14-inch ones, which are far louder than 20s. Oh, yes. I yes. had a record somewhere. I think you, I don't know whether you have it or not. Probably. It was the French tenor Jean Note. Oh, yes. And it was so loud, it was deafening. Yes. And yes. that, that was just a 14-inch 14 I- 14 disc. Yeah, and those Pathé machines really are very primitive, but they throw out a heck oh, of a lot do. of sound. very much so. And Indeed. there is no adjustment of sound. There's no, sh- um, uh, oh, no. soft-tone Pathé no, style. No, you can't. But though thinking about it, they must have made different sizes of Pathé stylus because... They did. I had... Um, I had some very small ones, but seven some mm. pathé I had was seven inch. Yes, I've got some of and those. And they were they were really fine, quite fine grooves. Yeah, and they don't play with a ball sign. No, they I'm don't. I'm sure they don't. No. They must be. They must have had, for their smaller, cheaper machines, some sort of smaller style, you know, exactly. diameter styli. Yes. I don't know what they were. Nobody seems to know, but no, um, no, they probably no, did. But no. these play with a normal uh, LP stylus, don't they? Well, 78 yes, LP yeah. stylus. Well, the thing is, I fitted the turntable up with a, a crystal turnover cartridge, mm. so it gives a fairly high output for mm. driving this amplifier, and it also tends to, with the right equipment, tends to flatten off the surface noise just a little bit. Mm. I mean, these are noisy because they've had a lot of use, and they're yes. quite worn. I've cleaned them. I might give them a polish and see if I can just polish them up a bit more. Mm. But no, that's a sort of that's a really fascinating things like that. Yes, absolutely amazing. Well, thank you very much for sharing no us. Hope that was jolly interesting. Hope everybody's enjoyed it. Yes. Well, I don't know which number Squire Rambles on this is. I think that'll have to be researched. Uh, yeah, we'll have to look into that one. But uh, thank you for joining us, viewers. No problem. And um, I'm sure we'll meet soon. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye-bye. you. Goodbye.